I didn't understand the object Freddy shook in my face, or why he was so excited. Halloween night in 87 wasn't as illuminated as today. It's a picture, he spat into my face. Look, look. I put my pillowcase down and held his wrist gently to see the fuss. A Polaroid picture with Freddy in his sad pirate costume. When I looked more closely, however, I saw the singed boy beneath. Polaroid Freddy looked burnt to a crisp, his skin gone, the eyes melted away. Freddy snapped the picture from my fingers. Isn't it cool? He studied it again. Like a magic trick. Best Halloween ever, right? It's cool, right? He continued to bully me for validation, as ten-year-old boys do, until I relented. It's cool, Freddy. Where'd you get it? You know Mr. Malcolm's house? Super green lawn guy? Tells dirty jokes to us at the bus stop? The weirdo pervert, that guy? Freddy nodded enthusiastically, missing my intended sarcasm. Everyone usually avoided Mr. Malcolm's house on Halloween, and every other day. The man constantly invited kids inside for candy and conversation. I don't know if anyone accepted that offer. I hope not. Yeah, Freddy confirmed, but there's a young guy on the porch, probably his nephew or something. He's got on a mega spooky demon mask, and he's got a camera, and he takes your picture and it prints out all freaky like mine and... Whoa, Freddy, I said. He was getting overexcited. Freddy had something wrong with him. A weak heart, maybe. Though, I can't recall exactly what we were told. Other than that, he could die if he got too worked up. Our teachers told us to look out for Freddy. So I did. It's great. Calm down. I started breathing with him and held his hand. He smiled. Thanks, man. Want to see? I smiled back. Yep. The photo had creeped me out, but also fascinated me. I didn't want to be the only kid who missed out on something cool. Judging by the line extending down the walkway, bending at a right angle onto the sidewalk, it seemed I might. There had to be 50 kids waiting for their photo. Polaroid pictures aren't fast. They don't present an image until at least 10 minutes have gone by. The guy on the porch wore a thin mask with horns that really seemed to grow from his forehead. A mouthpiece displayed jagged teeth. He carefully placed the undeveloped photo on a shoe rack at his side. You don't shake Polaroid pictures. You wait. And so, we waited. He could have simply given the white rectangles to the eager kids before the image showed. But he didn't. Instead, after taking a trick-or-treater's photo, he sat cross-legged on Mr. Malcolm's concrete slab of a porch and stared at the child. Some kids tried to talk with him. He didn't answer. Others waited in silence, bearing the stranger's gaze with admirable defiance. One little boy began to cry. His parents ushered him away before he could collect his photo. I remember thinking how fortunate I was that my parents let me trick-or-treat on my own. I would get my photo. I would endure the awkwardness of the adult gaze. Time ticked on. It was late. Some kids gave up and left the line, to my delight. Freddy yawned and said he had to go. I thanked him for telling me about the Polaroid man. I probably wouldn't have come down Ferry Street otherwise. Mr. Malcolm creeped me out too much. Luckily, a few other school friends were revealed by their departures. May DeFranco and Vicky Rand. They'd already gotten their photos, but hung around because May's little sister wanted one too. Can I see? I asked, pointing at the photos. They were grotesque, and I could hardly bear it. May's body appeared popped open, entrails spilling from her guts and onto splintered remnants of bone and muscle. Only the pink princess dress she wore as her costume identified her as the corpse in the photo. Vicky's was far worse. Her dead body had been tied at the wrists and ankles. Her pale face appeared stunned at the mutilation of her body. The top half had been pulled apart from the bottom, and there were more tortured dead around her in a dark field. Cool, right? Vicky said. It's like Freddy Krueger or something. You've never seen Freddy Krueger, May said. I hadn't seen a nightmare on Elm Street either. I never have. 
At the time, I assumed the contents of the photo were typical horror movie stuff. I wasn't ready for it, but I wouldn't let my discomfort show. After May's sister got her photo, more kids thought better of risking their worried parents' wrath. They left, and after one more boy got his photo, my turn came, at 11.42 p.m. My parents were probably pissed off by 8, so I figured, wrongly, that I wouldn't be in any more trouble for continuing to stay out way past the time I should have been home. Though I did have second thoughts, especially when I realized no other kids remained. I would be the last, and I was alone with a devil-masked man. Don't smile, he growled. I adjusted my face quickly to obey. He snapped the picture and sat on the stoop. We waited. The last leaves on the tree hissed a warning in the wind. Their dead brethren skittered away down Ferry Street. I could hardly breathe as he stared. There were no visible eyes in the sockets of his mask, only oily voids. An unfortunate trick of the dim porch bulb. It had to be. The feeling in my stomach called for a quick escape. I think I need to go, I told him. His hand gripped my wrist hard. I squirmed. It's okay, I can pick it up tomorrow. He did not let go. His face, that mask, got close to mine. He was perfectly quiet. No inhalation or exhale as he forced me to stay put. Please, I begged. I want to go home. In the half-inch space between our noses, he slid the developing Polaroid. This close, I could barely see anything. Then the devil's mask appeared in the photo. Then I, or what would become of me, materialized. The Polaroid featured us together, his hands around my neck, my face empty of life. I yelped and pulled away. He let go and I fell onto the walkway. He stood up and tossed the photo with precision. It landed beside me on the grass. Further details of the horror were revealed. A swath of blood matted my hair and soaked the front of my costume like a gory bib. The man in the devil mask had done more than strangle me according to the image. I backed away, a reverse crab walk of cumbersome doom. He hadn't moved because he could catch me any time he liked. His first step knocked his camera off the stoop. It clattered and a piece shot away from the impact. He didn't seem to care. Please, I pleaded with him. I don't remember the specifics of how I got up and ran down the middle of Ferry Street. I only recall the chase was brief because I made a mistake and got cornered in the Variety Store parking lot. The store, Brothers Variety, had been closed for hours. There'd be no help there. The streets were empty. Most people were asleep. How I knew this or thought about it in such a terrible moment came down to dumb luck. I backed into a pile of leaves bunched up with fake spider webs that had blown off someone's house. Stuck, I raised my arms defensively and caught the time on my digital watch. The wrong side of midnight by 12 minutes. His fingers caressed the sides of my cheeks. I closed my eyes and started trembling uncontrollably. Pain would be next. Great pain, the photo promised. And death. No. I tried to shout, but it came out like a squeak. Halloween is over. It's over. It's done. You can't. I didn't know what I was saying or why. But the fingers retreated, and he took noiseless steps backwards over the cracked tarmac. When he reached the sidewalk, he spoke. See you next year, then. As if it had been a prank all along, he walked away casually. It took far too long for me to go the opposite way. Eventually, I managed a slow jog, working through the blocks to home, where my mom waited in the front window, worried and angry. Punishment was left up to my father. When he returned from searching for me, I told him about the photo and the guy in the mask. He received the information passively before grabbing his baseball bat and calling his brothers. Together, they went to Mr. Malcolm's and discovered the busted door in the backyard. The old man had died in his chair, completely naked. My dad told me this last detail some years later. 
Police were called, but nothing came of whatever investigation might have followed. My parents had, and have, no faith in the Bridal Vale Lake PD. Hence the reason why he called his brothers and picked up his bat that night. Evidence of the devil-masked man existed, of course. Many kids had their photos taken. No police or adults asked about it, as far as I know. Mine had been left on Mr. Malcolm's lawn, but Freddy, May, and Vicky said they still had theirs at home. Freddy's, however, likely burned up in the fire following Christmas. His dad made the mistake of using a space heater in the garage. All of them, including Freddy, were dead the day before Christmas Eve. I refused to go trick-or-treating the next year, and every one after that. My parents understood and didn't pressure me. Within a few years, I aged out of the tradition, but still wouldn't risk going out for a walk on Halloween night. See you next year, then. And, if not, the next, or the next, or the next. He waits. I know, because every photo has turned out to be true. Vicky simply disappeared before her 19th birthday. And while her body was never recovered, a man suspected of torturing and killing half a dozen young women in Bridal Vale Lake and Derry across the border was arrested as the likely culprit. May committed suicide off the old casino hotel last July. My son is five now. He wants me to take him trick-or-treating in a few weeks. Of course he does. He doesn't know. Neither does my wife. That man is waiting for me. Hey guys. Story number two is a fun one today. It's one of my favorites and it'll be coming up in just a second. If you're enjoying today's video, I hope you'll subscribe. Leave a quick comment below. I was just looking the other day and saw that almost half the people who watch the channel aren't subscribed. So please, if you enjoy my videos, I hope you'll take a quick second just to hit that subscribe button. Okay, now on to our second story. I've been having nightmares lately. Not the fun, getting chased around by vampires, end up reigning victorious over them, overcoming your fears kind of nightmares either. I'm having the kind of nightmares you wake up covered in cold sweat from. The kind you're afraid to close your eyes again after having. And so it was this morning. I had struggled to fall asleep last night, not knowing what manner of terrors awaited me in my dreams. So I woke up twice as tired as I had been the day before. The lack of sleep was causing my mind to fracture in ways I did not understand. I had heard lack of sleep causes hallucinations, but I had never expected to experience that for myself. Not until today, that is. I had marched sleepily from my apartment door down the hallway to the elevator. The morning still bathed in silence and darkness at that hour. Not yet even 4 a.m. The keys jingled in my hand and I yawned, still not knowing why I was leaving or where I was going. Perhaps the fresh air would do my mind some good, I thought to myself, remembering how when I was a kid a long drive would always put me to sleep. Or maybe, just maybe, something else was pulling the strings, making me walk down that hallway like a marionette, with only an illusion of self-determination and free will. Either way, the end result was the same. I left my apartment during that witching hour, when nothing is quite the way it should be, and everything is off its axis just a little bit. When I stepped onto the elevator, I recoiled with a start, I was surprised at that time of night to see a repairman standing there, working with a screwdriver on the panel with the buttons. Almost finished here, and she'll be working again like brand new. Give me a few seconds. Uh, sure, no problem. They're here, you know, he said nonchalantly. Who? The Dream Stealers. I was so confused, but more than that I was feeling dizzy and lightheaded at the sight of this man. A strange deja vu overcoming my mind. Do I know you? I asked, my voice trembling and uneven. My hands were shaking badly. Mm, I should hope so, he said. You created me, after all. 
He finished screwing in the last Phillips head and put the screwdriver back in his tool belt. Then he hit the button with the G on it and I felt us going down. You created a lot of other things, too. Some of them, maybe you shouldn't have. You're him. The, the elevator repairman, but... You were just a character in a story. You shouldn't be here. The words sounded like they were coming from a great distance away, and yet they came from my own lips. Listen, kid. There isn't time for all this. We're almost at the ground floor, and when we get there, you're going to step out of this elevator and go out to the parking lot, and things are going to start to go downhill real quick after that, so just listen to me, okay? I nodded at the elevator repairman as the world seemed to spin further and further off its axis, and my vision started to turn sideways with it sickeningly. Whatever you do, don't take the deal. Right after he said that, the chime rang, indicating we had reached the ground floor. I glanced away from him at the doors in front of me, waiting for them to open, and when I looked back, he was gone, as if he had never been there in the first place. Whatever you do, don't take the deal. Had any of that been real? Or was my mind still drifting in and out of sleep and I just hallucinated a waking dream of some sort? I decided quickly that it was the latter of the two. Part of me had been ready to go straight back upstairs and forego the early morning drive, but now the recollection of the repairman was quickly fading and seeming more and more like a dream. The elevator doors opened and I stepped out, just as I had planned to, and proceeded to the back door of the building leading to the parking lot. My memories of everything the man in the elevator had said to me were fading and soon disappeared entirely, but his last warning stuck with me. As I stepped outside into the cool morning air, I heard him speak to me again as if straight in my ear. Whatever you do, don't take the deal. Walking towards my car, I heard footsteps in the darkness. They were moving towards me from the shadows, only they sounded wet and goopy. I looked back, terrified to see something coming out of the darkness, lurching towards me on one leg. It was a writhing mass of body parts, fingers and toes, feet and hands. A wet, bloody intake of air indicated it was alive in some fashion, and it started moving faster towards me. My hands shook as I fumbled with the keys and tried to fit them in the door lock. Numb with fear, I dropped them to the asphalt of the parking lot and bent down quickly to pick them up. Shit, shit, shit. The thing was closer now, only a few car lengths away, and getting nearer by the second. I tried to push the key into the lock of the door handle, but it seemed not to fit. Like every way I put it was the wrong way. The thing was so close I could smell it now, coppery and rancid like spoiled meat. Finally I managed to fit the key in and open the door as quick as I could, jumping into the driver's seat. I slammed the door behind me, gunned the engine and drove away before getting a quick look at the thing. Whatever it was, I was happy to just leave it behind. Strangely, my memories of that creature faded quickly as well and I harbored a growing unease which spread through my mind and body like something terrible was about to happen. I drove for what felt like hours, losing all track of time and yet the sun never rose. It stayed dark and moonless as I took my car around in circles, feeling no closer to sleep and only more exhausted. A 24-hour convenience store came into view up ahead on the right and I turned into the lot. I parked the car and got out, noticing the place was abandoned except for the man behind the counter. Opening the door and stepping inside, I felt that strange sense of deja vu again. Looking at the clerk, it doubled in strength, and I felt that sensation of the world tipping on its axis once more. The man behind the counter was wearing spectacles, and had a small, bemused smile. He wore a black suit with gold cuffs and collar. Why the hell did he look so damn familiar? Do I know you? I heard myself ask quietly. Everything suddenly seemed like it was happening in slow motion. And it was as if I had no control over anything anymore, not even my own movements. I found myself standing in front of him as if a conveyor belt had brought me there while blinking. I should hope you know me, Mr. Group. How do you know my name? Footfalls came from behind me and I spun to see a creature that was half man and half octopus. At least that's the best way I could describe him. His skin blended and bled like paint matching the backdrop behind him so he was half invisible. 
but the illusion was lost in the bright lights of the store, and because of his movements, he was noticeable. I guessed that in a dark room, this creature would be able to blend in perfectly, to become lost in the shadows. We know everything about you. Your worst fears. Your biggest secrets. Your regrets and disappointments. We see everything, the octopus man said. I felt myself turning back to the man behind the counter. Again, it was like I was watching someone playing a video game and I was the avatar, unable to control myself. We can make all your wildest dreams come true, said the man behind the counter with the gold cuffs and collar. You just have to sign here. He had a contract laid out on the counter and I saw there was a pen in my hand hovering over the form ready to sign it. Images flashed before my eyes of a giant mansion, dream vacations, drinking from a coconut on a beach and never working again, Ferraris and swimming pools and stacks of cash. Who the hell are you? I looked down at the contract and saw the other signing party on the form was listed at the bottom. The spidery cursive was difficult to make out, but barely legible. It was only five letters, after all. It's not so much who we are. The important thing is who and what we represent. We would like you to work for us. See, with your help, the big guy downstairs is feeling confident. We can move forward into the next millennia with a really creative variety of ways to terrify people for eternity. You could think of yourself as a creative consultant, if you like. The rewards are literally limitless. Your pay could be whatever you imagine. All you have to do is sign here. The voice was becoming deeper, darker, and more insistent. Tentacles wrapped around my shoulder reassuringly at first, and then giving a sharp squeeze of painful encouragement. Sign it! My shaking hand dropped the pen and I shook my head. This is a nightmare. It has to be. The tentacles wrapped around my throat and I saw the man behind the counter had pulled out a large butcher's cleaver and was now polishing it with a rag. The items had come from nowhere as if he had produced them by magic. Wake up! I closed my eyes and opened them again and found myself parked at the side of the road out in the country. It was still dark somehow, despite the fact that I felt like I had been asleep for hours. Thankfully, I had pulled over to the side of the road and taken a nap. The car was in park, at least, and I was safe. The events inside the convenience store had all been a dream. Memories of it lingering momentarily and then slipping away like sand through my fingers. I needed to go home and get back to bed. To get some real sleep. I've been writing too much lately and not getting enough rest. Clearly that was the cause of these bad nightmares and hallucinations. Lack of sleep and too much horror on my mind. Turning the key in the ignition, I found it wouldn't start. It was like the battery was dead. The sound of crunching gravel behind the car startled me and I found myself holding my breath. Listening. Terrified. It was footsteps. And then the passenger door opened, despite my mind telling my hand to hit the door lock button. I was frozen once again, everything moving in slow motion. A man sat down in the passenger seat. He had a greasy ponytail and a long, bird-like face. He smelled like cigarette smoke and incense, like sweat in the road. In his lap was a satchel bag that he was carrying with him. Things inside it seemed to move and squirm, deforming the sack as if they were trying to scratch their way out. Moaning sounds of distress and terror escaped from within. Having car trouble? The familiar-looking hitchhiker said. Of course, I had seen them before. I had seen them all before in my mind. How do I get the feeling you already know the answer to that, Mr. Hitchhiker from Hell? He patted the dashboard as if it was a talking cat's belly, and the key turned in my hand without any effort. The engine roared to life, and the RPMs went into the red as it revved, hungry for the road. You don't get to choose. You have one option. You take the deal. Say yes. His eyes bore into mine and his face was serious as he waited for my answer. No. Instantly, his face changed into a horrifying, demonic visage. His eyes were red and shadows contorted his features. 
his mouth open in a sneering smile, and he opened wide, looking ready to consume me. It's not real. None of this is real. My trembling words sounded false to my own ears, but I tried to remember the words of the repairman. His advice. I closed my eyes and hoped this demon would disappear like the others had. Whatever you do, don't take the deal. Wake up. I found myself back in my own bedroom. The sheets strewn about and thrown everywhere. It had all been a dream. Nothing more than a terrible nightmare. My wife, Christine, came into the bedroom carrying a cup of coffee for me. Steam rose from it and the smell made my mouth water. Morning, I said sleepily. Oh, you wouldn't believe the nightmare I had last night. It's absolutely terrifying. She looked at me sympathetically with her pale blue eyes. But wait, I thought to myself. Her eyes were green, not blue. You know, you really should have taken the deal, she said, a gold and purple vine creeping out of her mouth. Wake up! Become a channel member today for early access, bonus videos, and special emojis only available to members. Check out the description below or click the join button for more info. If you'd like another way to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash jordangrouphorror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content, you'll be credited at the end of every video going forward, and if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you which will be featured in a Hollow's End story. Links to join the Patreon are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening, please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow, and see you again next time at 4pm Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.